What, what can we say? What is the paper that uh, you're working on uh, propose about the ideas around these cortical microcircuits? So this is a fully functional model for the microcircuits of the visual cortex. So the, the paper focuses and your idea in our discussions now is focusing on vision. Yeah. The uh, visual cortex. Okay. Yeah. So this I, is a model. This is a full model. It says, th- this, this is how vision works. Uh, th- well, this is, this is a, a yeah, model of, yeah. A so, hypothesis. Okay. So let me, let me step back uh, a bit. Um, so we looked at neuroscience for insights on how to build a vision model. Right. And, and, and we synthesized all those insights into a computational model. This is called the recursive cortical network model that we, we used for breaking captchas. And, uh, and we are using the same model for robotic picking and uh, uh, tracking of objects. And that, again, is a vision system. That's a vision Com- system. Computer vision system. That's a computer vision system. It takes in images and outputs what? On one side, it outputs the class of the image uh, and also segments the image. Uh, and you can also ask it further queries. Where is the edge of the object? Where is the interior of the object? So, it. so it's a, it's a model that you build to answer multiple questions. So you are not trying to build a model for just classification or just segmentation, etc. So it's a it's a it's a joint model that can do multiple things. Um, and um, so so that's the model that we built using insights from neuroscience. And some of those insights are what is the role of feedback connections. What is the role of lateral connections? Uh, so all those things went into the model. The, the model actually uses feedback connections. All these ideas from your from your it, sides. Yeah. Uh, so what 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 the heck is a recursive cortical network? Like what what are the architecture approaches? Interesting aspects here, which is essentially a brain inspired approach to a computer vision. Yeah. So there are multiple layers to this question. I can go from the very very top and then zoom in. Okay. Mm. So one important thing, constraint that went into the model is that you should not think vision, think of vision as something in isolation. We should not think perception as something as a preprocessor for cognition. Mm -hmm. Perception and cognition are interconnected. And so you should not think of one problem in separation from the other problem. Um, And so that means if you finally want to have a system that understands concepts, uh, about the world and can learn a, in a very conceptual model of the world and can reason and connect to language, all of those things, you need to you need to have think all the way through and make sure that your perception system is compatible with your cognition system and language system and all of them. And one aspect of that is top-down controllability. Um, what does that mean? So that means, you know, so, so think of, you know, you can close your eyes and uh, think about the details of one object, right? I can I can zoom in further and further. I can mm-hmm. you know so so think of the bottle in front of me, right? Mm-hmm. And and now you can think about okay what the cap of that bottle looks. Uh, I know you can think about what's the texture on that bottle of the uh, the cap. You know you can think about you know what will happen if uh, something hits that. Uh, so you can you can you can manipulate your visual knowledge in. Uh, cognition-driven ways. Yes. Uh, and so this top-down controllability uh, and being uh, able to simulate scenarios in the world. So you're not just a passive uh, player in this perception game. You you can Correct. you can control it. You can Correct. you you have imagination. Correct. Correct. So 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 basically, you know, basically having a generative network, yeah. uh, which is a model, and and it is not just some arbitrary generative network. It has to be it has to be built in a way that it is controllable top down mm-hmm. it is it is not just trying to generate a whole picture at once uh, you know it's not trying to generate photorealistic things of the world you you know you don't have good photorealistic models of the world human brains do not have if i if i for example ask you the question uh, what is the color of the letter e in the google logo you have no idea. No idea. <laughs> Although you have seen it millions of times, th- <laughs> or not th- millions of times, hundreds of times. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so it's not our model is not photorealistic, but but it is. But it has other properties that we can manipulate it uh, in the uh, and you can think about filling in a different color in that logo. You can think about expanding the the letter E. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you can see what in. So you can imagine the consequence of you know, actions that you have never performed. So so these are the kind of characteristics the generative model need to have. So this is one constraint that went into our model. Like, you know, so this is, 
when you read the just the perception side of the paper it is not obvious that this was a constraint into the into, that went into the model this top down controllability of the generative model uh so what what is uh, top down controllability in a model look like it's a really interesting concept fascinating concept yeah. what is that is that the recursive recursiveness gives you that or how, how do you how it's, do you do it? um quite a few things it's like what what does the model factor uh, factorize you know what are the what is the model representing as different pieces in the puzzle like you know so right. so in the rcn uh, network it it thinks of the world you know so for example the background of an image is modeled separately from the foreground of the image you know? so it. so the the objects are separate from the background they are different entities so there's a kind of segmentation that's built in fundamentally Correct. into the and, and and then even that object is composed of parts and also and another one is the the shape of the object uh, is differently modeled from the texture of the object got it so there's like these um uh, i've been you know who francois chollet is Yes, uh, yeah, yeah. He's so, so there's uh, he he developed this like IQ test type of thing for right. Arc Challenge for, and uh, it's kind of cool that there's um, these concepts priors that he defines that you bring to the table in order to be able to reason about basic shapes and things in an IQ test. Right. So here you're making it qu quite explicit that here here are the things that you should be the, these are like distinct things that you should be able to. Uh, model in yeah. this keep in mind that you you can derive this from much more general principles it doesn't you don't need to explicitly put it as oh objects versus foreground versus background uh the surface versus texture no these are these are derivable from uh, more fundamental principles of how you know what's the property of continuity of natural signals what's the property of continuity of natural signals yeah by the way that sounds very poetic but yeah uh so you're saying that's a th there's some low level properties from which emerges the idea that shapes should be different than Ex like uh, should, there should be a parts of an object there should be i mean exactly kind of like francois talk, i mean there's objectness there's all Got these it. things that it's kind of crazy that we humans uh, I guess evolved to have because it's useful for Correct. us to perceive the world. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And it, it derives mostly from the properties of natural signals. And yeah. and so um natural signals. So natural signals are the kind of things we'll perceive in the in the natural world. Correct. I don't know. I don't I don't know why that sounds so beautiful. Natural signals, yeah. As opposed to a QR code, right? Which is an artificial oh. signal that we created. Humans are not very good at classifying QR codes. We are very good at saying well, something is a cat or a dog, yeah. but not very good at, you know, the classifying, where computers are very good at classifying QR codes. Um, so our, our visual system is tuned for natural signals. Uh, and there are fundamental assumptions in the architecture that are derived from natural signals uh, properties. I wonder when you take uh, hallucinogenic drugs, does that go into natural <laughs> or is that closer to the QR code? Uh, it's still natural. It's still natural? Yeah, yeah. because it's, it, it is still operating using your brains. By the way, on that on that topic, I, I mean, I haven't been following. I think they're becoming legalized in certain, I can't wait until they become legalized to a degree that you, like vision science researchers could study it. Yeah. Just like through through medical, chemical ways, modify there could be ethical concerns but modify that's another way to study the brain is to be be able to chemically modify it it's probably um probably very long a way to, to figure out how to do it ethically yeah but, but i th i think there are studies on that already uh, already yeah i think so uh because you, it's you, it's you, not unethical to give uh it to rats so. Oh, that's true. That's true. <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot of drugged up rats out there. Okay, yeah. cool. Sorry, sorry to. So okay, so there's uh, so there's these uh, uh, low level uh, things from natural signals that uh, that that uh, that can con from which these properties will emerge. Yes. Uh, but it is still a very hard problem on how to encode that. You know, so you don't. You know, there is no. Uh, so uh, you mentioned um, the 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 priors uh, Francho wanted to encode in uh, in the uh, abstract reasoning challenge, but mm -hmm. it is not straightforward how to encode those priors. Um, so so some of those uh, challenges, like you know, the object rec uh, completion challenges, are things that we 
purely use our visual system to do. It is. Uh, it looks like abstract reasoning, but it is purely an output of a, uh, the the vision system. For example, completing the corners of that Kinsa triangle, completing the lines of that Kinsa triangle. It's a purely a visual system property. It, you know, it's there is no abstract reasoning involved. It it uses all these priors, but it is stored in our visual system in a particular way that is amenable to inference. And and. And that is one of the things that we tackled in the, you know, so basically saying, okay, these are the prior knowledge uh, which which will be derived from the world. But then how is that prior knowledge represented in the model such that inference when, when some piece of evidence comes in can be done very efficiently and in a very distributed way? Um, because it is very, there are so many ways of representing knowledge which is not amenable to very quick inference. You know, quick lookups, uh, mm -hmm. and so that's one um, core part of what we tackled in uh, the RCN model. Um, uh, how do you encode visual knowledge to uh, do very quick inference? And yeah, can you maybe comment on uh, so folks listening to this and in general may be familiar with different kinds of architectures of neural networks. What what are we talking about with the RCN? Uh, what are, what does the architecture look like? What are the different components? Is it close to neural networks? Is it far away from neural networks? What does it look like? Yeah, so so you can uh, think of the delta between the model and a convolutional neural network if if people are familiar with convolutional neural networks. So convolutional neural networks have this feed forward processing cascade, which is called uh, feature detectors and pooling, and that is repeated in the in the hierarchy in in a a uh, multi-level uh, system, um, and if you if you want to an intuitive idea of what what is happening, feature detectors are uh, you know detecting interesting co-occurrences in the input. Mm -hmm. It can be a line, a corner, a, a, an eye, or a piece of texture, etc. And the, the pooling neurons are doing some local transformation of that and making it invariant to local transformations. So this is what the structure of convolutional neural network is. Um, recursive cortical network has a similar structure when you look at just the feed forward pathway. But in addition to that, it is also structured in a way that it is generative so that it can, it can run it backward and combine the forward with the backward. Mm -hmm. Another aspect that it has is it has lateral connections. These lateral connections um, which is bet between, so if you have an edge here and an edge here, it has connections between these edges. It is not just feed forward connections. It is um, something between these edges, which is uh, the, the nodes representing these edges, which is to enforce compatibility between them. So otherwise what will happen is like that- constraints? It's a constraint. It's basically, if you, if you do just feature detection followed by pooling, then your, your transformations in different parts of the visual field are not coordinated. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you can you will create a uh, jagged when you when you generate from the model you will create jagged um, uh, uh, things and uncoordinated transformations so these lateral connections are enforcing the the transformations is the whole thing still differentiable uh no okay no, no. <laughs> it's not it's not trained using a uh, backprop okay that's really important so yeah. uh so there's these feed forward there's feedback mechanisms there's some interesting connectivity things. It's still layered, like uh, yes, there uh, are multiple levels, yes. multi multiple uh, layers. Okay, very very interesting.